to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast. This week, coming to you from the Soho Theatre in central London. My name is Dan Schreiber. I'm sitting here with James Harkin, Andy Murray, and Anna Chizinski. And once again, we have gathered around the microphones with our four favorite facts from the last seven days. And in no particular order, here we go. Starting with you, Andy Murray. My fact this week is that when you have a tattoo lasered off, you end up pooing it out. <laughs> so, um, that's what happens. Does it, does it still have the same design on the poo? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, this, this, is, this happens. So when you have a tattoo, it goes into the middle layer of the skin, which is called the dermis. And um, when it's lasered off, um, the, the beams of light, they heat up the ink and it breaks down into tiny particles. And those go into the bloodstream, and then they are excreted via the liver and the digestive system. And that's how they get out of you. Um, oh, I just think that's, that's quite, amazing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that says something about how little you want the tattoo anymore, doesn't it? It's sort of a, it's a statement. But so do you know what the... tattoos are made out of? Like the ink? Do you know where that comes from? Right. Okay, well, um, there was a lady on Facebook who got a tattoo of vegan on her inner lip. And then her friends pointed out that actually most black ink of tattoos is made from burnt animal bones. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, God. She's going to see that every time she looks in the mirror. Every time she eats anything, she's going to get a little God, bit. Oh, that's the worst part. Um, you animal can, bones. Yeah, you can get vegan tattoos, but they're very rare indeed. Right. Yeah. That's, the oldest wow. tattoo we know of is on a lip, isn't it? Is it's it? a tattoo of a thin pencil moustache uh, <laughs> tattooed onto the upper lip of a 7,000-year-old mummy from Chile. Wow. Mm. Yeah. What, like a little French kind I'm of... I'm not sure if it has the gap down the middle that a pencil moustache is supposed to have. But... I didn't... Do they have to have a gap down the middle? Don't they? No. I... I've yeah, never heard yeah, All right, yeah. <laughs> I think of someone who's never been able to grow a moustache. <laughs> I, I don't know. Dan? Uh, um, I, I don't know. Yeah. My grandmother has tattooed eyebrows. Is she hot? <laughs> Does she, like, permanently look surprised? Or... Um, I don't know where her original eyebrows went, though. That's what I don't know. <laughs> Did she poo them out? <laughs> I did think you were going to say your grandmother had a thin pencil moustache. <laughs> kind of a cruel thing to share. Yeah. So the thing on tattoos being quite... Uh, sort of the stereotype of them being for, for sailors or for criminals or whatever it is. Um, the headline, Tattoos Are Not Just For Sailors Anymore, has appeared in print every decade since the mid-19th century. <laughs> every, every decade, there's a rash of articles saying, they've entered the mainstream, here they are. So today, more teachers have them than members of the armed forces. Really? Yeah, by 14% to 9%. But it used to be like 90% of sailors had tattoos, wasn't it? Something yeah. like that in the yeah. 19th century, probably. Like, yeah. yeah. And um, one thing that it was good for was it meant that you could um, identify a sailor who had drowned because you'd be able to identify them by the tattoos. Wow. And they were actually used in that way. Sorry, you could tell that he, he had a tattoo that said, I have drowned? <laughs> <laughs> he, gets, he has a lot of tattoos. The first one says, help. The second one says, help, get lower down. The third one says, blub, blub, blub. Yeah. And the it's other thing so that nice. they thought the sailors is, if you had hold tattooed on your knuckles on one hand and fast on the other hand, then it would help you hold onto ropes better. One way you could stop drowning as a sailor, apparently, was to have a pig tattooed on your knee and then a cock, uh, as in a rooster, tattooed on your right leg somewhere. And they had a saying that was, pig on the knee, safety at sea, a cock on the right, never lose a fight. Uh, um, which is weird. Uh, Neither of those animals can swim. Uh, all yeah. yeah. Fight very well. Uh, speaking of um, cocks and tattoos. Yes. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes when I want to find out some facts for this show, I'll go back to the old QI top boards and see what I wrote in the past. And I searched for tattoos, and I found something that Dan posted in 2005. Really? And this is what he said. He said, I was told today that if a man was to have a tattoo done on his, on his penis, then he was entitled to free tattoos for the rest of his life from anywhere in the world in any tattoo parlor. <laughs> <laughs> no questions asked. <laughs> Uh, this is what used to pass for QI research back in the day. So I have a confession. Uh, it's not just my grandmother with a tattoo. Um, well, I had a look, and there are one or two tattoo parlors that will claim that they will do that, whether they will or not, I don't know, but it's not everyone in the world all the time. It's a very difficult thing to Google, by the way. Um, but it's very I... easy to Google. It's very difficult to forget. <laughs> yeah. I shouldn't have gotten Google images, really, today. 
Um, but I found a, a story about a 21-year-old from Iran who paid a tattoo artist to put the letter M for his girlfriend's last name and the Persian phrase for good luck with your journeys on his penis. Uh, and he felt pain for eight days and then his, uh, his penis became permanently semi-erect so he couldn't get it to go down. He lived with it for three months before getting medical help and doctors tried shunting the penis to drain excess blood. I'm not sure what shunting. shunting. Yeah, it's <laughs> weird, that, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then it didn't work, and so the patient decided he was fine with the condition and declined further treatment. <laughs> wow. 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 <laughs> At the turn oh. of the... So they were a quite a high society thing, weren't they, in the 19th century? And at no. the turn of... So um, in about 1900, a uh, New York newspaper estimated that 75% of society ladies in New York had tattoos. Wow. 75%? Yep. That's but what kind, what kind of tattoos? Like practical ones or... <laughs> <laughs> practical tattoos? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to... I'm back <laughs> away from that. No, 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 you do. Don't back away. Step up. Okay. You, you, get, you get medical tattoos. And we yeah. think that some of the oldest tattoos ever, yeah. which are 5,000 years old, the 3,000 BC, we found bodies where there's a body in the Alps which has tattoos over his joints, and they looked at the skeleton, and he had osteoarthritis in those joints. So it's like a kind ah. of um, acupuncture. This is the Iceman, ah. in fact, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I meant by it, actually, because the Mercury astronauts, apparently, sure it was, as well. By the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, 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 but I, I, I looked into whether or not astronauts had any tattoos, because I just thought that they seem like the type of people that would, and majoritively... <laughs> <laughs> what, what? I feel like I'm saying a lot of things that it's just me agreeing with. <laughs> Uh, Mercury astronauts, uh, they would have them uh, in just, like, sensor locations, basically, for whenever they had to monitor their health, so they knew where they were. They would, oh, kind of oh, like putting a bit like of tape on the ground as a mark for yeah, an actor. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, there was a guy who was arrested by Canada's Border Services Agency um, with the letters H-A-T-E on his knuckles, and he claimed that it stood for happiness all through eternity. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Quick thinker. Um, um, one woman used an internet translation to um, translate I love David into Hebrew. She later discovered she inadvertently had the phrase Babylon is the world's leading dictionary and translation software <laughs> <laughs> on her back forever. <laughs> 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 But she doesn't have a free account with Babylon Forever, so... <laughs> David Beckham has Victoria Beckham's name misspelt, tattooed onto his body in Hindi. Yeah. Oh, dear. And Samantha Cameron has a tattoo. Does she? Yeah, she's cooler than all of us. Uh, hello, Dan's grandmother. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Is it a practical That's tattoo? Right. Or... <laughs> It's a dolphin on her ankle. Is that practical? Oh, that's practical. No, that's cool. Why did she... Was that just a, a holiday that she took once, or...? With <laughs> to a dolphin. <laughs> <laughs> to a dolphinarium. No, just you go on a holiday, you holiday. get a tattoo. Oh, no, I don't mean as like, oh, has anyone got a camera? No? Oh, okay. <laughs> Quick, tattoo that dolphin so I can live this memory forever. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, oh, good. There's an American guy who has over a thousand tattoos based on Disney characters, including all 101 of 101 Dalmatians. <laughs> <laughs> Which wow. I don't. And he's they got... must be tiny, though. Uh, the Dalmatians. Well, they're, they're well, I mean, obviously none of them is life size, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> how many? I, I divide a single, you know, the area of a body by a thousand. It's not much room you've got. Yeah, so, I mean, I think it is to scale, but it is scaled down. Okay. Um, and he has a system, so he has all the, ba- all the evil characters are below his knees, and all the undersea characters are below his belly. So um. I don't know, but then all the evil characters aren't under the sea, so I don't know how he, he works that out. Wow. Um, anyway, he's get, he gets him copyright, copyrighted by Disney, like Disney's allowed him to do it. Oh, really? He's, he's the oh. only person. Why is it illegal to do a, a Disney tattoo? I think uh, when you've what got that do? many of them. What would they do? Make you poo it out? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to have to move on to our next fact, so if anyone has anything more that they want to add. <laughs> on, um, on mistakes in tattoos, um, John Carew, who's a footballer? Yeah, John Carew. John Carew. Um, he got a tattoo saying, um, he wanted it to say, my life, my rules, so he got ma vie, uh, mes règles, um, but he got the accent wrong on regla. He, he, made, he got an acute accent instead of a grave one, which translates as, my life, my menstruation. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, it's time for our second fact of the evening, and that fact is Chazinski's. 
Yeah, my fact is that the man who invented the airship used to hold dinner parties with 10 foot high chairs so that his guests could experience the joy of flight. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is amazing Brazilian guy called Alberto Santos Dumont and first of all he decided to have them hanging from the ceiling which you could understand was more reminiscent of flight but on one of his first dinner parties he put all his guests hanging from the ceiling and the ceiling collapsed so he <laughs> so <laughs> after, all the, after all the funerals of the previous guests <laughs> weirdly no one wanted to come to the next party and the ceiling was fine <laughs> yeah so the wake will be at mine I've organised a nice dinner um... <laughs> wow um, yeah, he was great. He was an inventor. He grew up on a plantation in Brazil, and he invented a toy motor-powered functioning aeroplane, which was quite a long time before the first aeroplanes were invented in the late 19th century. And then he moved to Paris and became a celebrity because he invented the airship, which attracted attention, and used to, yeah, invite celebrities and royalty to his house and have these wacky dinner parties. And they'd have to mount their seats on ladders. And <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. He was so famous in his time that the Times said... When the names of all those who have occupied outstanding positions in the world have been forgotten, there will be a name which will remain in our memory, that of Santos Dumont. What, what was the name again? <laughs> <laughs> he does sound like an amazing guy. He sounds unbelievable, actually. As in, he had his own airship in Paris when no one else had any means of flight. He was just flying around the streets of Paris. He would just stop at a cafe tether it and then go down to the cafe then say well so you later and fly off <laughs> this is in the late 19th century early 20th century he just did it Where, what was he tethering to uh, rooftops like, and lamp posts and things like yeah. that it wasn't huge when you look at photos of it it's not a massive airship it's oh, not okay. the size of the R101 or the Hindu no it's Bible. a one man airship I think a yeah. personal it's airship. unbelievable he would go past ladies bedrooms and they would throw their underwear out of the window at him <laughs> no. that's how famous he was really yeah yeah, yeah. He was a ge also super generous, so he was responsible for the first woman ever to take flight because there was a princess, I can't she was a princess of some foreign country who came to visit Paris, took an interest in his airship, said, I wouldn't mind going up on one of those, and he taught her to fly one, and then he had her flying one through the streets of Paris, and he cycled below shouting her instructions as she did so. Uh -huh. And this was the first woman to fly. Wow. God, I actually, it sounds way worse to think of men throwing their underwear at her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. I'm not... <laughs> he invented other things as well. I know, the 10 foot chair. No one talks about it. <laughs> no one mentions the 10 foot chair. Yeah, we've all got one. Um, no, he invented a set of motorized skis to get him back up a mountain. <laughs> And he invented a slingshot which would throw life belts out from sinking ships so that everyone could have a life belt. He also invented a racing airship which was similar to his airship, but he never raced it because he had no one to race against. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that is so sad. <laughs> just made two, couldn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Can, I, can I bring it to dinner parties very quickly? Yeah, I just want to talk about my favourite dinner party host uh, from history, which is William Buckland. He's a very exciting character. He, um, he studied fossils and he was a geologist, um, but he also went on this massive mission to eat every single thing in the animal kingdom. He was just like, I need to have everything. His favourite, so if you went to his house for dinner, you would end up having things like elephant's trunk or mice on toast was his favourite thing. And he knew, he knew food so, like he knew animal food, everything about them so well that he was once invited uh, to go to this church where they thought a saint's blood was on the ground of this church and he came over there and he had a look at it and he was like no because it was just this patch on the ground and thought, oh it's the saint's blood he leaned down he licked it and he came back up and went no it's bat urine like he, <laughs> he just knew but also the worst guest to have at a dinner party in that respect because he went to this party which was uh, Lord Harcourt he's the Archbishop of York and at the dinner Harcourt was like I've got this amazing relic that I want to show you all and he brought out what was the heart of Louis the Sixteenth in a box and within seconds Buckland just grabbed it and he ate it <laughs> but you say worst dinner guest ever very few dinner hosts bring the heart of a dead king <laughs> to the table I would say worst dinner host ever okay here's another dinner party thing the christening of Louis the um, 14th grandson uh, he created a cake uh, sorry there was a great um, a great uh, chef called Antoine Carême who uh, created a cake and the cake was made out of almond paste pastry and clockwork and I love clockwork I love it so much and it's so hard to get these days <laughs> in pastries yeah. every Greg's I go into <laughs> Um, they had clockwork because this cake on top of it had a baby duke entering the world through a marzipan vagina. <laughs> that is quite a centrepiece, isn't it? <laughs> 
So it was. It, sorry, it was him. It was celebrating him. The, the and it child. Was a, yeah. It was a model of of his mother giving birth to him. Yes, through marzipan with clockwork. <laughs> Don't get oh. that, Greg. Do you? No. no. <laughs> Wow. I was, I was reading that back in the day when furniture was just suddenly being introduced to the idea of us having it in our homes and stuff. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I know, it's a weird sentence. Like, I, I, when furniture was being introduced to the idea of having it, it in was, our homes. It was quite a shock for furniture. It wasn't domesticated <laughs> until yeah. the 1500s. <laughs> The beautiful days when, you know, freestanding chaises would just roam the belt. <laughs> oh, God. It's there are only... a wild chair these days. Yeah. It's you know, there are, there are only 400 Louis XIV tables left in the wild. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, Doug. Oh, no, that was my fact. So, yeah, <laughs> uh, um... No, they apparently when we when we started introducing furniture, we like cupboards would just be put in the middle of the room as opposed to against the wall now. Right. And d- dinner tables, we didn't used to have legs to dinner tables. You would have people come and sit. If you were having a party, there would be a big board like this that you would bring out and you would put it on your legs. So they'd just be wow. sat on your legs. And that's why apparently there were boards and you would be a boarder and apparently boarders who stay in your house. That's why they're called boarders because you would they would be part of the legs. That would hold and the you table would all up. Hold the table up. Yeah, you hold you? the table up with your legs. This, I read this in Bill Bryson's book at home, and he used to say that carpets. Um, before we used to walk on them, you'd just have them on your wall, and you'd go, "It's my carpet." And, <laughs> and if you had a special guest, and you'd take it down from the wall, and you'd put it for them to walk on. And, and chairs used to be against the walls. You would have chairs against the walls because at night, when you didn't have electricity, you would not trip over stuff in the middle of your room. But if you had chairs all over the shop, then you might hurt yourself. <laughs> Where are you going? <laughs> You should, be, you should be asleep. They would get up halfway through the night, wouldn't they? Because the, people used to sleep in yes. two, two different sections. And yeah. then get up and have sex or you know, <laughs> do the crossword. You're very or... confident, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, we're going to have to move on. Um, should we I move think... on? Has anyone got anything else? I quite like the inactivity chair, which has recently been invented, which is a chair with only two legs. Ooh. And it is basically so that you live in fear while you sit on it <laughs> and have to constantly be doing a balancing act. And I think the idea is that you can exercise while also being seated, but it sounds awful. Anyway, invest I, in one if you're looking to improve your health. I always think I'm not afraid enough when I'm sitting down. <laughs> Podcast. We have an emergency announcement to make, and this is it. Today's installment of No Such Thing as a Fish was produced with the help of Squarespace, which is that award-winning website builder that has 24-7 support, e-commerce, beautiful templates. Uh, it just makes it really easy to tell your story, however tedious that story may be, to the world. Give your story a voice by going to squarespace.com and use the offer code FISH to save 10% off your order. Okay, back to the podcast. Um, Okay, time for fact number three. That is my fact. My fact this week is that a new scientific study has concluded that there are too many scientific studies. (laughs) (laughs) It's basically the study was saying that it's doing a thing now where so many studies are coming out in science that it's diminishing the attention that gets um, given to an yeah. actual good study because it's it's drawing headlines away from them and and studies are going so sort of minute into these little, I don't know, like yeah, there's there's great ones that we've read in the past uh, that we've talked about in the office and stuff. A, a study that showed that the fish herring, that they fart oh, yeah. to communicate with each other. <laughs> that's how they talk and that's a study and that might get in the way of say... Yeah, but that that could be a good study because like you might want to know if there's a load. So in I think it was in Scandinavia somewhere they heard a load of like bubbles underneath the sea and they thought it might have been like a, a Russian submarine or something like that, but it turned out to be herrings communicating by farting to each other. <laughs> and if you hadn't done the study, you wouldn't know that that was a thing. And so probably saved World War Russia III. Russia and the whole. <laughs> okay, so that was a bad example. <laughs> but... <laughs> There are lots of studies yeah. that are uh, that seem yeah. to be taking attention away. Yeah. So it's the idea that we forget as well. Yes. So we might have sold, we might have cracked everything five years ago, <laughs> but just not noticed at the time, and now we're carrying on and on with more studies. Mm-hmm. And we do start do some irrelevance. To, I mean, not we personally, but uh, the Royal Society of Chemistry last year published eleven steps on how to make the perfect cup of tea. Uh, which definitively determined after releasing this paper that you are supposed to put the milk in first 
to avoid denaturation oh, yeah. of the milk. We actually mm. have big arguments in the QI <laughs> office about how to make tea, don't we? And I can sense a lot of anger. I know. <laughs> Oh my god, that was the most British thing ever. <laughs> there was a there was a palpable it wasn't a hiss, but it was it was a, it was an intake of breath, yeah. wasn't it? I think we all felt that. <laughs> so I'm I am with the breath intake because I obviously think that's a travesty to suggest you put the milk in first, but that is what they say, that's the safer way to do it. Um, it's also explained in this study. <laughs> safer. <laughs> Three more tea deaths in Walton Stone. <laughs> So the, the single most downloaded uh, paper in the history of the journal, uh, is it PLOS Medicine, P-L-O-S, yeah, PLOS. is the 2005 paper, Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. <laughs> it's quite good, isn't it? Um, so there's a, there's a guy who's written a lot of studies about falsehoods in science, and his name is John Ioannidis. And as a boy, he was already doing research on research, as it were. He was doing meta-research. And when he was a child, he came up with a love numbers system to work out how affectionate he was about his own family. Uh, he said, my mother was getting 1,024.42. My grandmother, 173.73. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah, he said basically that all the statistics in all these papers are a bit dubious, etc. Yeah. But then a lot of people have said actually his statistics are a bit dubious Ooh. as well. So, yeah, all right, a bit controversial. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is certainly. Sorry, go on. sorry. Go on. Oh, is I assume he was talking about co like um, publication bias, or yeah. so the publication bias is a major problem in scientific studies, isn't it? Because only positive results tend to be published, and about ninety percent of studies that are done actually yield negative results which aren't as headline grabbing and there are journals now which are like the journal of negative results which is just people who have done experiments and gone we nope. found nothing <laughs> <laughs> nothing has been achieved here and there's also a guy called mark schreim at harvard who wanted to see how easy it would be to get something published and so he published an article, and he made one up using randomtextgenerator.com. Uh, and the article was called Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Uh, and it was by Pinkerton A. LeBrain and Orson Welles. Uh, and he submitted it to 37 journals over two weeks, and it was accepted by 17 of them. Wow. wow. I know. Pinkerton A. LeBrain. <laughs> it's, it's nominative determinism, isn't it? Because, you know, you have a name like LeBrain, you're going to be a scientist. <laughs> there's a journal called Brain, isn't there? Do you remember that? Uh, there's a journal called Brain, and there's a guy who used to be the head of Brain who was called Head. Uh, Henry Head, it was. And then he left Brain, and then when he left being the head of Brain, Head was replaced as the head of Brain by a guy called Brain. Wow. <laughs> Um, there's, a, there's a website called Retraction Watch, which is fun because it, it, they pay attention to uh, people quietly retracting their research when it turns out to be wrong. Oh, wow. And, um, that is so, fun. Yeah, it was set up by these two uh, journalists uh, called Ivan Oransky and Adam Marcus, and they're absolute heroes. And um, the top one or two retraction holders are both uh, anesthesiologists, for what it's worth. Uh, and there is one scientist in Japan who has had to retract uh, 183 papers out of 212. <laughs> oh, wow. Stop <laughs> publishing him. <laughs> <laughs> but his name is Captain Awesome, so they assume <laughs> it must be right. Yeah. So I went on to dailymail.co.uk and searched for, according to a recent study, just to see if there were too many, really. Uh, and here were the first five things I found. Um, even sharks can be shy, according to a new study. <laughs> we have covered on the podcast that sharks can have friends, so oh. let's not... Um, me? Let's not be a shy shark. Um, study reveals the tactics we use to avoid being heard on the loo. That's oh, fun. that's great. Oh, what yeah. are, what are, uh, any, <laughs> any, any... Any tips for them? Any tips? <laughs> <laughs> I only read the headline, sorry. Uh, another one was, Bump in the night, send in the wife. One in five men pretend to be asleep when hearing a possible intruder according to a recent oh. Fortunately, fortunately, it's almost always furniture. <laughs> they have a place safely by the wall. <laughs> Um, we're we're going to have to move okay. on. We okay, one more thing. I, um, I looked at other things that there's too many of, yeah. uh, and there was a study done uh, that said, <laughs> it said three quarters of viewers of television have cited confusion over the proliferation of choice as the reason they miss shows. 
As in, there's so many channels, they always miss TV shows. Okay. They're just flicking desperately between them. Yeah, and they can't find the right one. Uh, so I had a look at all the different channels on my, um, on my TV system, on Sky, uh, and I found one which I'd never seen before. It's paversshoes.tv, and it's um, Sky Channel 669. And their programs include Sensational Sandals, <laughs> Pretty in Pumps, and Classic Clogs. <laughs> Sounds like the best channel ever. That you know, I think you're on this. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> So um, it's 669. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but in the UK, it's 667. <laughs> it's a shoe size joke. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to have to move on to our final fact. <laughs> come, come, how did the shoe material go out? <laughs> <laughs> Time for our final fact of the evening, and uh, that is James. Okay, my fact is that you should never pick up a desert tortoise. If you do, it can pee itself to death. <laughs> oh. Oh. Uh, yeah, so what they do is they store urine in their bladder, which they can then draw upon because they live in the desert, so they need as much water as they can get. And if you pick them up, they can get so scared that they will evacuate their bladder as in wet themselves, right. and then they can die of dehydration. Uh, dehydration. Yeah, that's really because serious, they uh, keep um, something like 40% of their body mass is kept as the urine that then translates into a sort of like rehydrated water. Not a rehydrated. Yeah. It's really, really diluted, yeah. I think. Yeah, so yeah. it's not too uh, acidic or yeah, it doesn't damage them. Yeah. But it's just a way that something can live in the desert, but obviously then they don't expect people to just come and pick them up and then, <laughs> and then they die. But yeah... Um, Desert tortoises, pretty cool. Uh, they live around the Las Vegas area, around Nevada, around there. Um, they dig basins to catch rainwater, another way they get water. And they always know where they are. And whenever it looks like it's going to rain, they're always found next to these places that they've dug waiting for the water to come so they can wow. immediately drink it. And weirdly, this is really strange, humans um, are not so likely to die when they're in the, you know, children or, or teenagers or whatever and you get more likely to die as you get older but weirdly desert tortoises they uh, are less likely to die as the time goes on <laughs> the older they get the less likely they are yeah to die. yeah so that's why they live for so long and oh. that's the, like tortoises do live for a long time yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's true of these well, what, one was so old i read this in um uh, and, and apparently there's a bit of contention about whether or not this is true or not but one of Dar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. We'll, what we'll do is we'll cut that out and put it at the start of every fact you say. Basically, there was a tortoise called Harriet, which oh, yeah. belonged to Charles Darwin. So the, the contentious bit is, did that belong to Charles Darwin? They're not fully sure. But Harriet had a bit of a travelled life after Darwin or whoever got her, ended up in Australia Zoo, and ended up being looked after by Steve Irwin. So oh, really? Steve Irwin and Charles Darwin are connected within wow. one lifetime. Wow. Yeah, that is really cool. There was a tortoise called... Uh, <laughs> There was a tortoise called Adwaita uh, who lived to the age of 255 and that meant that this tortoise was born before the USA existed and their death was announced on CNN. Wow. So there's some quite good footage of uh, tortoises sniff each other's bums like dogs because they secrete pheromones from like the cloaca or from that area and there's quite good footage of a uh, female tortoise crawling over a lettuce and then secreting her scent as she goes and then a male tortoise really enthusiastically trying to have sex with a lettuce because <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, lettuce was used to they did think it was an aphrodisiac didn't they in ancient yes. Egypt they did tortoises they did. and people did yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's because it they used to grow quite tall they used to have wild lettuce which yeah. was really tall and it wasn't like a normal boring modern lettuce it was yeah. quite exciting and it secreted a white sap <laughs> it secreted a white sap and it tasted peppery and it was yeah and it was it was a stem and it secreted and, you know it lettuce was... used to be better yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, apparently tortoises can use touchscreen technology now <laughs> they can touch touch things no so so uh, they because no because they found they found that tortoises are actually a lot more cleverer than they believed them to be originally uh, for example in mazes they're fantastic in mazes they can remember multiple destinations in one single route which often yeah. rats can't do and now they're teaching them to use touchscreen technology to um, <laughs> to, <laughs> to create Spotify lists of great music um, <laughs> Because they've got great taste in music, which um, Captain Awesome published in his recent paper. Uh, 
I haven't seen the retraction list. I don't know if it was in that. But he, uh, they, so if they need more food um, and they give them grapes and apples and stuff, they, they press the right button that highlights itself. So they, and, go, what, they go into a car dome and just <laughs> more lettuce, more lettuce, more lettuce. <laughs> Oh, by the way, uh, apparently, because so, I've always been confused between what a tortoise and a turtle is. Oh, yeah. And so I'm just going to say it in case everyone here doesn't know the difference. No, but a tortoise has feet and a turtle has flippers. Okay. So now Makes we know. Sense. That's, That's a very good way of... And yeah. so I thought they should have been called ninja tortoises because they have feet. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dan, I think you've redeemed yourself with that fact. <laughs> What was amazing about that was it took ages for everyone to go, that wasn't as dumb as it <laughs> definitely sounded. Um, so on, uh, on ways of uh, staying hydrated in the desert, where oh, there's, yeah. there's no water and no rain, um, there are lots of very cool ways of doing it. So there are some beetles which, um, when night is just turning into day, they stand very still and they let fog condense on their bodies and then they can drink it because they, it, it uh-huh. slowly coalesces onto them and then they have enough water to get them through That's the day. Clever. The name for these beetles is fog stand beetles. <laughs> <laughs> Someone thought that was a, the best name on that day that they could come up with. That, I can, every time you see animals and their names, it's always like, who gave... There's, there's a tortoise <laughs> called the big-headed tortoise. <laughs> Like, that was a very small it creative meeting. Well, he told me he was the best tortoise. Uh, right. Here's some... <laughs> uh, some other tortoise names while we're here. Uh, the pancake tortoise. Uh, the geometric tortoise. The impressed tortoise. <laughs> who hangs around with a big head tortoise, I guess. <laughs> um, this guy, I really like him. Um, the wolf volcano giant tortoise. <laughs> It just sounds like the four best things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's got a really good PR manager. <laughs> other ways of... So other desert animals that have, like, good ways of storing their water are... So roadrunners urinate out of their eyes. What? Things, what? That's, like, they cry. I have not seen that in the cartoon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they, it's how they excrete their salt, because you, uh, you use up a lot of water. You lose a lot of water when you urinate, yeah. so they wow. just lose it through their eyes. Also, mountain goats, you've got to be really careful now, apparently, in areas of mountain goats, like in North America, because they really like human urine, because they've realised they don't have a natural salt, um, a natural thing they eat that provides them with their salt, but they have worked out that mountaineers we and that has salt in it and so they will spot human mountaineers and follow them until they go to take a, a wee and then they will sometimes maul them in an <laughs> attempt to what? It, drink their oh god excretion yeah you've got to look out where do they maul no i don't want to know where they... <laughs> don't turtles pee through their mouth uh, some there species some. Yeah, there yeah, some. some of them do yeah and there are some uh, the fitzroy river turtle breathes through its anus Whoa. oh yeah it's a really cool turtle. It's Australian, I think. And, um, yeah, it is. It's in the Fitzroy River. And it, it, it lives in, op- in water, which has a lot of oxygen in it. And um, its, uh, its cloacal orifice goes two-thirds of the way along it, and it gets 68% of its oxygen through its bottom. Wow. It's a lot. <laughs> Did you know a tortoise was once the fastest animal in the world? <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> it really was. Uh, no, Are this... you talking... Can I guess what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, no, no, tell it. So. No, is it the space thing? It is the space yeah, thing. so smart. Okay, go on, you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like we got a big head of tortoise in the room. <laughs> I'm very fast. Okay. <laughs> this was in 1968, and the um, Soviets sent out a spaceship with, um, from Kazakhstan with a tortoise on it, and it was the first animal in deep space and it travelled round the moon before returning to Earth seven days later. So for that short amount of time, it was the fastest animal in the world. Um, there were also wine flies, mealworms, and a few other things, but that was the, that was the main one. That was yeah. the headline grabber, wasn't it? Yeah. The poor <laughs> mealworms going, I was there too. <laughs> but that was, they were the first life forms as well to get around to yeah, the moon. to go around the back yeah. of the moon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so your fact was about things wetting themselves, in a way, and we don't know why. There's no evolutionary reason why a lot of animals wet themselves when they're afraid, and it's really weird. So gazelles wet themselves when they're being chased by lions. Not very useful. Well, one uh, theory is that it might like send the lions off because they have the scent somewhere else, right? 
I think that's one theory. But don't anyway. they surely they chase the scent until they reach the bottom? Yeah, so you pee, <laughs> and then the lion will stop and go, oh, there's there's a smell of gazelle pee there, and then... Yeah, I mean, that's just one theory. Yeah. But what it is with humans when you get shocked, I think, is, like, somehow your brain gets overridden by the shock, and normally your brain is... Like, you always yeah. want to pee, and your brain's saying, no, don't pee, you're yeah. on stage. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah. you're shocked so much that you end up wetting yourself. Yeah. It's weird. There's a bit of the brain called the Pontine Micturition Center, which is constantly saying, let's go, let's do it. Um, and it really? Yeah. When your bladder is full, it makes the decision to, to empty the bladder. And then, but the prefrontal cortex always overrides the desire. But when you get really, really, really stressed, um, the limbic system overrides the prefrontal cortex, and so you, the signals get confused, and then, you know, it's, wow. it's, it's, it's all cold and you're ashamed. But we don't know why. <laughs> but it's one to start off with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're going to have to wrap up. We're, okay, one more thing. Yep. Go for okay, it. so there was a guy whose um, tortoise had a, a swollen penis, and he, he didn't have the money to pay for the operation, and so he went on to uh, one of these Kickstarter-style things, and he needed £200, and he reached his target in less than 24 hours. And he went over, he went up to £555 in the end. People, like, really clubbed together and, and paid for it. And when you, um, when you gave your money, you could put a little note about what you wanted to say. Uh, one person said, I hope he gets the repair done soon. I know what it's like having an enlarged penis. <laughs> That is not so nice. <laughs> but at least he gave some money, so... Uh, we hope that turtle's doing well. And um, we're going to have to wrap up. Uh, so that's it. That's all of our facts. Thanks so much for being here. Um, if you want to get in contact with any of us about the things we've said, you can get us all on our Twitter account. So I'm on at Schreiberland. James? At Egg Shaped. Andy? At Andrew Hunter M. Jasinski? You can email podcast at qi.com. And we've got about 53 episodes up on no such thing as a fish.com. You can listen to those previous episodes there. We're going to be back again for our final live show at the Soho Theatre next week. And yeah, we'll see you again next time. Goodbye. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you.